Well, good, good morning, everybody. Welcome to BDO. A um, couple of bits of admin before we start. Um, we're filming today, um, just to record this, and I've just been asked if you could turn your mobile phones off because it interferes with the microphones. Um, so if people could turn mobile phones off, that would be good. Uh, secondly, if there is a fire or a security incident, just follow us. Um, it's too complicated to tell you exactly where to go from this particular room, but we'll guide you out. So, um, this morning couldn't be more topical given the events of this weekend, um, which we will cover in, um, in the sessions that we've got planned today. Um, this is about the change of a letter. It's about um, CCA becoming FCA. And, and the consequences of that, which for most non-regulated businesses will be significant. Um, you are going to go into an intrusive regime um, with a, um, a fairly um, aggressive regulator. Um, and that does need a change of behavior. It needs change of culture in many organizations. And as we will discover, it will need significant investment in uh, information capture and retention and controls systems and governance within many businesses. Um, secondly, uh, you're going to go into a regime which nobody is clear about because the rules haven't been finalized. And even though there's only four months to the start of regulation, we are still debating what that regulation will look like. And that's a difficult thing for any organization to face. Um, there's no clear timetable for when that regulation will be finalized. Um, so everybody has to be agile. Um, they've got to have resource to deal with things as and when um, they are concluded in the new year. Uh, and it will be a tight timetable to 1st of April and the dawn of the new regulation. And thirdly, and, and this is important for anybody who is already regulated, you will understand this, it comes with some responsibility and it's significant responsibility for approved persons. Um, we were talking to the regulator uh, a couple of weeks ago, two or three weeks ago, uh, and the, the thing on the regulator's mind is that there are 41,000 Consumer Credit Act licensed firms. At the moment, they're regulating something in the region of 7,000 entities. And suddenly, they've got to cope with 41,000 new ones. And that's causing them a headache. Understandably, it's causing them a headache. And what we said to them was, where are 41,000 approved persons coming from? Are there 41,000 people that will ac be acceptable to you as a regulator in the sector? And they said, no, we don't think that there are 41,000 people in the sector that we would trust as approved persons. So the obvious question is, what's going to happen in the sector? Um, and of course, there's going to be huge change, and it's going to be structural change because you cannot simply move from a position where 41,000 entities have light touch guidance from the OFT to being responsible with criminal liability, in some cases attaching to the approved persons, with an aggressive, intrusive regulator. So this is a significant issue. And we're going to go through some of the, um, some of the consequences of that this morning. And uh, we're going to have four speeches, four people speaking. Um, Gavin Reevely. Um, who is from BDO and, and until recently was a senior associate at the FCA um, in the retail group. So we'll be able to give a regulator side perspective, I hope, Gavin, um, on the issues that they're wrestling with. Uh, David Morrie, who is um, our, a partner in our financial services advisory practice. And we've also got Russell Hamblin Boone, who's the chief executive of the Consumer Finance Association, and John Fairhurst, who's the Managing Director of PayPlan, which is one of the UK's <coughs> largest providers of debt-free solutions. Now, I know, John, you have to go at 9.45, so we'll keep on timetable. Uh, but after that, there is going to be a plenary session where any one of the speakers will answer any questions that you have. Um, and um, please do, do ask uh, uh, during that session if there are any things you want us to comment on. So. Um, without further ado, um, David. Oh. <laughs> I'm going to take over the, um, the hosting duties. Um, uh, so I'll be the uh, the uh, maitre d for the uh, ensuing presentations, as well as uh, taking a few moments to reflect on the uh, regulations myself. I'll actually start by uh, asking Gavin to um, come to the uh, podium to provide his view. Hopefully. 
Uh, Gavin brings not only the uh, the inside knowledge and understanding of the the FCA's approach uh, historically and on these issues, uh, but also having now left that organisation can speak a little more freely than he might uh, might have otherwise done so, which I hope we'll find useful. Gavin. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, can you all hear me okay? Great. Well, as David just said, I'm uh, from the FCA, ex-FCA. Um, I will, for that matter, be able to talk to you more candidly than I would have done if I was uh, employed by them. Um, as we all know, next year, uh, in, on the 1st of uh, April, there's going to be a change in the regulation OFT to FCA. Now, we are having a major change here. We're going from light touch regulation, legalistic, guidance-based, to a more intensive, more tough regime with, with detailed principles, uh, detailed rules and principles. So there's going to be a major change. Right, so what is coming your way? We're going to have a tough new regulator that's going to be targeting businesses, uh, targeting your businesses, and they're going to be intrusive, and they're going to be dedicated to being forensic, understanding your business, understanding where customer weaknesses are. Um, they're going to have a lot of resource, they're throwing a lot of resource at this, a lot more than the OFT ever had. They're, at last count, um, they're going to have, they're looking to uh, populate about 300 regulators dedicated purely to consumer credit. This is, um, the message from this really is, is that they're, they're taking this seriously and they're doing it right. So also, the regulator is a risk-based regulator. So the resources they do have, they're going to focus them on the areas that they think are the highest risk. Um, more about that later. Um, the regulator is also going to have power to enforce. They're, they're quite a powerful regulator. They've been given a lot of powers from statute, and they're not afraid to use them. And they're also going to be a reluctant pricing regulator. This is something that's a new development. I don't think they even they knew about, really. They've never set themselves up as being a pricing regulator. Um, a couple of that with the fact that they're going to... The, the, the uh, government has given them a duty of regulation, gives me the impression that, in fact, that they didn't really want it. So, what's their approach? Now, their prime objective is to be uh, is customer protection, consumer protection. This is about customer outcomes, making sure that customers get the right deal for them. That is at the heart of what the FCA uh, want. It's what they, they're looking to do. They're looking for customer detriment in areas where firms are weak. So they're going to be focused on the drivers um, for all of this. The, the drivers are the underlying uh, pieces uh, that, uh, that they will zero in on um, and um, And then, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> they'll zero in on that. So how are they going to do this? Their, their approach is a uh, three-stage approach, really. They have authorization, which is the gatekeeper process. This is going to be a high tide mark for firms to have to achieve. Uh, more about that in a minute. There's supervision, uh, which is um, a dedicated uh, team of uh, regulators uh, the supervisors for consumer credit are going to be um, targeting, um, there's going to be themes, there's going to be proactive um, supervision from dedicated teams of, of regulators, and there's going to be uh, sector-specific regulators as well. So they'll be targeting thematic as well as, as firm-focused uh, issues. And thirdly, there's going to be enforcement. For any wrongdoing, they're going to be uh, using their powers to punish firms. And again, they're not afraid to use such powers. So, moving on to what kind of enforcement they could use. Now, they've got a, a, a range, a raft of which I've, I've put some examples up here. 
they are um, they're able to withdraw permissions or change permissions, which is quite a nuclear option, but they have used it before, and I'm sure they'll use it again. There's also, they have a new product banning um, powers, uh, which can be used throughout the industry, all dedicated to a specific firm. They can also instruct skilled persons at your cost to um, conduct work, assessments, and corrective work. There's also, they can order redress, which is one of the key points that they use uh, in, in their regulation. Uh, and also they use fines and personal, uh, 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 they use fines and public censure to punish people. So what does this mean for you? What is the impact on the industry? So there's going to be tougher rules and there's going to be higher expectations. They're going to be looking to do principle-based regulation, which is FCA's new principle, FCA's principles, which are new to the consumer credit or, uh, firms, which are not just the letter of the rules, but also the spirit of the rules. They're also having an increased, uh, there's going to be an increased uh, reliance on compliance. These compliance departments are going to be relied on heavily to make sure that firms, that, that you, are doing what you need to do to keep the right side of the regulator. There's also going to be increased costs as a result of all this. I mean, uh, by the regulator's own reckoning, startup costs 200 million plus redress at 80 million, and then steady state costs of 130 million per annum after that. And that doesn't take into account loss in revenue. So, What's that going to uh, cause? The likelihood is there's going to be significant market exit. So they're saying that 25 to 30% payday lenders are going to exit the market. FCA say that um, about 15% of non-bank lenders will exit the market. And credit brokers and secondary credit brokers to the tune of 10 to 15% may exit the market as a result. So, what does this mean for you and your firms? Well, there's going to be threshold conditions which you have to meet, which is around suitability. Are you suitable to do to run your business? Do you pay due care and attention to the regulator's objectives? Then there's cultural assessment this, and business models. They, they focus a lot, and this is where the drivers come from. They'll look at business model, target the areas of risk. They will, they'll look at areas such as profitability, areas of growth, conflicts of interest. Also, a dry key driver is the cultural assessment. There's culture. So they'll make an assessment of this. So they will look at the tone from the top, how you organise yourself, and how that translates into the business. They will also... There's also a piece here in regards to preparing, in regards to governance. So this is about structure, the framework of your governance, the composition of the people suitable, suitably qualified uh, to, do, to govern and, and have the overview of the business, and then the process, how it's actually done, how you get the correct MI, reporting structures, quality of debate, that's the type of thing they're going to be looking for. There's also an approved regime, a person's regime, which is, a, which is something that the firm is, as Mark mentioned earlier, firm will need to get involved in. It's a firm, an FCA will be approving individuals who will then have responsibilities. And those responsibilities um, are wide ranging and, and the result of that is that there's potential for individuals to be found. Well, I think, in summary, just to say that there's a lot coming your way, and it's going to be a game changer, not just for the industry, but for the FCA as well. And there's a lot to do before April. Thank you.
Thanks, Gavin. Uh, I should say, actually, at the end of the, um, the talks, we'll be having a panel session, so opportunities at the end to, uh, to ask any follow-up questions you might have. Um, if I could take the opportunity now to uh, introduce our next speaker, which is uh, Russell Hamlin Boone, who is the Chief Executive of the Consumer Finance Association. As, um, is it to the enviable, un unenviable task of representing uh, <laughs> of representing much of the, 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 the payday lending sector, um, which is clearly in the, uh, in, the, in the sights of the regulator and, and the government uh, in a major way. So um, if I can ask Russell to come and talk about his views on how his industry is going to be impacted. Good morning. Um, thank you for inviting me to come and talk to you. Uh, as I said, I'm Russell Hamlin Boone, Chief Executive of the Consumer Finance Association, and that's the principal trade association representing some of the larger uh, short-term lenders because uh, although we often call them payday, that's something of a misnomer now because there's such variety in the market, um, and I'll, I'll refer to short-term uh, lending. Um, and I just wanted to talk to you about some of the things that the industry has been doing in the last 12 months in preparation for FCA regulation, um, some of the challenges we face looking ahead to our new <coughs> regulator. So I just want to do uh, three things in particular. I want to tackle some of the common and in some cases strongly held views and misconceptions about the industry. Um, I want to make a case for short-term loans as a legitimate part of people's financial toolkit. Um, and I want to explain something of the standards um, and, and good practice uh, we've put in place to protect consumers and what that means for future policy under the new regulator. I'm not here to try to convince you of anything, um, but I do want to bring some balance to a, a debate that's, that somewhat demonised us recently. So, from the outset, I want to say, you know, we do recognise the concerns there are about the industry, and in, you know, we have a, there is a spectrum of views about it. Um, but short-term lending is relatively new, and it's changing and evolving all the time. And things have gone on in the past in certain parts of the industry that shouldn't have, um, and there are things to learn in terms of ways to improve. And ultimately, I believe that's what we've been doing uh, through the Consumer Finance Association um, since I joined a year ago, an awful lot has, has happened and some of the things that are reported about the industry are actually out of date. Even the, um, the OFT, which is often used as a reference point, um, conducted its study of the market 18 months ago and things are very different now. So. Um, I want to sort of take you through the process of a loan application and then identify some of the things that we've been doing um, in order to address people's um, concerns. Um, over the last year, we've tried to put things right, um, tried to help consumers having a bad experience. And in order to demonstrate that, we'll, I'll just take you through some various stages. So like any businesses, we obviously want to um, represent ourselves <clears throat> and our projects um, responsibly. Um, we already comply with seven different pieces of uh, advertising and marketing legislation. Contrary to uh, some uh, reports from some individuals, we don't target any specific groups of people and we certainly don't target children and there are no adverts on uh, children's television channels. So um, Ed Miliband's already achieved <clears throat> one of his um, uh, a manifesto objectives without actually having to do anything, so that's a good start. <laughs> um, but we do more than comply. We work with the uh, Advertising Standards Authority. We've designed some workshops specifically on short-term lending um, to help the lenders understand what the expectation of the, um, the Advertising Standards Authority is and in time what the expectation of the FCA is under the uh, financial promotions regime which will we'll come under. And anyone considering a loan needs to know all the costs up front. And lenders need to be completely transparent about that. All CFA members are committed to explaining clearly the costs of loans in pounds and pence, rather than the almost meaningless APR that we're required to use. And it helps people to know exactly how much they need to pay back and when they need to pay it. 
Recent research that um, we commissioned by YouGov revealed that our customers are reaping the rewards of a good uh, code of practice that we put in place um, a year ago. We asked um, people uh, whether they understood the cost of a loan before they committed to it, and 92% of those surveys said that they did, and these were telephone interviews, so these weren't just clicking, clicking online buttons. Um, the survey also showed that 85% of customers fully understood how their payments would be taken, which contrasts with other surveys, um, online surveys, and surveys that are being made, um, I think probably um, are a little bit um, self-selecting. Um, so the next stage would be affordability, and this is something that's very prominent in the uh, Financial Conduct Authority's mind, um, and I think is something that will um, run across all credit products in time. Um, it's a move on from credit worthiness. It's a move on from the OFT's irresponsible lending guidance and uh, debt collection guidance, which we assumed would be a kind of lift and shift, and I think other credit providers were feeling that um, that would be the case and that they were already compliant. I think this thing around affordability um, makes it much more difficult for um, when it comes to credit um, loan applications and approval of loan applications. Um, so assuming the cost was acceptable um, and somebody is applying for a loan, the first thing to say is that like any uh, creditor, you, you don't want to lend money to people who can't pay back. It's not, uh, it's not a good and sustainable business model and it's certainly not good for consumers or repeat business or any other of those things. Um, and so all our members conduct rigorous affordability assessment before granting loans. And that means if it's online churning thousands of pieces of data to make an accurate prediction, whether over a short period of time that person's circumstances are going to change, which, makes, which will make it difficult to recover your, uh, the money that's owed to you. One of the things that uh, is often said is that there were no checks when you ask customers, no, they didn't make any checks because as with a credit card application or a mortgage application, the checks go on behind the scenes. You don't see what's going on. You, you answer some questions and then the rest of it is all done with uh, working with credit reference agencies and profiling customers and all of those types of things. And there are thousands of pieces of data. I would argue probably more data is churned by short-term lenders than is by uh, other mainstream credit providers because they, they face a much higher risk. Um, and the competitive element of the market is front-loaded. It is about trying to reduce the risk and, and predict as accurately as possible that that individual will pay you back uh, on time. Because if they don't pay you back on time, you start to incur costs. I know that there are less reputable lenders who make their money from, um, if you like, a revolving credit product on a short term. Um, but the, the larger businesses don't have that business model. Um, simply because they want repeat business um, and they want to be able to recover their, uh, their loans as quickly as possible. So the speed of decision doesn't necessarily mean cutting corners and I recently applied for a, a credit card to um, transfer a balance and completed a very similar form as I would complete with a short-term lender, half a dozen, seven or eight um, different screens where you complete your details. I press submit and it came up approved instantly. And I didn't think, well, they didn't do a proper check on me um, because the technology exists that you can churn thousands of pieces of data in milliseconds um, to make a judgment. Uh, I sometimes suggest that the lenders will be better to have a little um, egg timer or something <laughs> clicking around like they do on the um, hotels and, uh, and, and the um, air, air flight. Um, you know, calculators, because you generally have a view that someone's there going, I'm just checking to get you the best flight. Whereas actually it's just, a, uh, it's all done on computer. Um, fraud is obviously something you, uh, you face um, when you're a new and novel uh, product to the market and there are always people looking to take advantage of that. And lenders need to protect themselves and their customers. And we've made strides forward in protecting businesses and customers against uh, against fraud and it includes all the usual things you would expect um, ID checks checking applicants bank accounts the debit card details in store you can do you can check photo IDs and things um, and as a result the fraud rate currently is at 0.02 percent of all loans made over the last 12 months by contrast 1.65 percent of all e-commerce revenues are lost to fraud 
So having been approved for a, a loan, and that would probably mean that you're one in 10 of the applications if it's an online loan, um, and three days before the payment date, we will um, call or email or text or a, a combination of those to let the customer know that there is money due to come out of their account. And this is the uh, controversial area of continuous payment authority. Um, and for most customers, continuous payment authority or CPA is an efficient and flexible way to pay back their loan without getting into financial difficulty, but it has to be reused responsibly. And that means we clearly explain how the CPA will work. Um, we contact the customer, as I said, three days before the due date, and that's a good opportunity to find out if there are any problems with the payment and so prevent that individual getting into um, a default situation. Advising the customer they can cancel the agreement if they choose to. Um, and uh, we won't um, seek payment from people if we think that that is going to um, eat into their priority debt. So their mortgage, their rent, uh, council tax, utility and food bills. Um, and if someone is identified as being in financial difficulty, um, their situation will be reassessed. And if appropriate, a refund will be made back into their account. Some people will want more time to pay, and if for some reason a customer needs a bit more time beyond the repayment date, the lender may consider an extension. Um, and as with any financial service product, there's a balance to be struck between customer protection and, and customer choice. There's no customer right to uh, an automatic rollover. Um, decisions about allowing customers to extend the loans can be quite difficult, and for some customers, rolling over a loan might actually allow them to manage more, uh, more efficiently and more helpfully their current financial situation. For other people, it might be better that they go into a longer term uh, repayment plan and, and, uh, and not uh, continue down the normal collections process. Um, the CFA code of practice restricts the number of times you can roll over to three. Um, the FCA have recently suggested that should go to two. Um, the FCA also said that it wants affordability assessments carried out each time there is a potential to extend a loan and uh, CFA members currently do that. Uh, and I think it's useful that we're having this con consultation on, whether, on what the level should be, what flexibility she, people um, should have, and we will be responding to the FCA on that point. For some people, um, circumstances change, especially over a short period of time, um, and uh, a small proportion of people will find themselves in difficulty. Um, and where that happens, um, you will find that lenders are sympathetic. We work closely with debt advice charities. We direct people to free debt advice if we find they're in financial hardship. The lenders have dedicated hardship teams of individuals who are empowered to um, make alternative arrangements, even to write off loans if that's um, the best solution decided with the, the um, debt advice charities. Um, we'll also freeze the fees and interests on the loan, so we effectively cap the loan already um, so that uh, debts don't grow anymore. Um, and I think that probably helping people in financial difficulty and putting restrictions, in fact, stopping their, uh, their loans getting any bigger is probably a better way of uh, capping than um, the, the political announcement that we had on Monday. Uh, and we also work uh, with the debt charities in developing a hotline service. One of the, the, the things the advisor said was that we've, we're struggling to get through to the right people and it's a long process. So we now have direct hotlines. We've piloted these um, earlier in the year. We're now rolling them out to all um, CAB advisors working up the, the front line. Um, and we also do a lot of uh, funding and um, financial education with uh, various um, consumer groups. Um, our customers are often portrayed as being vulnerable and unbanked. Um, and we commissioned uh, an independent study that revealed for the first time who our customers are. Um, and it took a detailed look at three groups of customers in particular whose lives have changed and the way they um, manage their finances have changed. Um, and those groups have all have one thing in common. Uh, and it's the requirement to access money at a relatively short notice. Um, I was going to, I'm running out of time here, but I was going to run through those various um, things. But what I maybe do is on our website, there is a, um, uh, 
uh, we've done the, the report and we can show you the profiles of those people and I might maybe come, come to them in the question session. So just to cover off a few things to, to dispel some misconceptions, here are some uh, do's and don'ts very quickly. We don't prey on vulnerable people. We don't create spirals of debt because we cap the loans. We don't dip into people's bank accounts without warning. Um, we don't get funding from state-owned banks. Often people say, let's just cut off their, um, uh, their wholesale um, funding stream. Um, uh, the OFT got its calculation wrong, and we don't make half our profits from rollovers. Um, and we do carry out credit checks, and we do offer, I believe, fair pricing in pounds and pence. But we'll see when we come to talk about caps whether that's the right thing. This is very quickly um, who our customers are. Um, there are three categories there. As I said, I'm not going to go into the detail of it. Young people, um, families, young families, growing families, and an interesting area, burden baby boomers. People who have very good salaries, um, sometimes two salaries. They can afford a couple of holidays a year, but they're squeezed between um, children who are dependent on them in, at, at, as, at a, as they're older, um, because they're not, maybe not getting into work or um, they're not able to get on the, the uh, mortgage ladder and things like that. So the children are dependent on them at an older age and their parents are living longer um, and continue to be dependent on them. That might be some of us might recognize those people. And so those people are squeezed and rely sometimes on short term fixes to sort out the daughter's car or parents' health care or whatever it might be. So um, I just want to finish on a reality check to say that we're not we're la lacking in regulation, but the industry is in, in a state of flux. Um, and I think we need time to observe um, some of the things that are in place and what the impact of those has been on consumers and how the market is changing. Um, I don't think any other sector has faced such intense scrutiny as we have. Um, this is just a, a few of the regulations, reviews and reports. I think probably this is the last... 18 months um, that we've been um, subject to. And I think the other thing to say that is even if we successfully um, achieve uh, the, the reduction in debt in this particular market, um, we need to remember the wider context. Step change report that payday loans are only responsible for 1.8% of their clients' debt. As you can see, there are many other credit products which um, account for more. The Money Advice Trust reports that its fastest growing debt issue is water companies, uh, closely followed by debt from energy companies, telecoms companies, and local authorities, uh, in particular, uh, chasing down the council tax. Um, and in August, you switch unexpectedly published some results um, uh, of a survey that showed that half paid a loan customers claim the experience was positive, which was a surprise and a pleasant one. Um, a small number of people, 30%, said that they'd take one out again. I can understand why that's a smaller number. We'd all like to avoid those unexpected financial pressures. We've heard of universities banning uh, adverts in, um, in uh, short-term uh, lenders, and actually only 2% of students ever get money in an emergency from uh, a short-term loan. Yesterday, PwC published its precious plastic report showing that student debt accounts for the entire increase in unsecured uh, debt. And unsecured debt um, rose by just over 4% in 2013 to £216 billion. Pounds. Um, and the majority of this was driven by increases in student borrowing. So there are some questions there about our future graduates um, becoming indebted. And the proportion of people using credit for essential items has actually fallen to 13% from 15% in 2011. Um, and among 25 to 34 year olds has fallen uh, a staggering 26% to 15% this year. So there are some positive signs for the economy. Um, and reforming the lending industry is important, and that's why we put in place all the changes we've made while we'll be working with the regulator over the coming months. However, I think we're being naive if we think sorting out the payday lending sector equates to sorting out financial difficulties faced by people in the UK. We actually um, have spent a, a lot of time and energy um, 
addressing things that I think, you know, are going to account for 1% of the consumer credit market and a fraction of consumer debt. Um, so many commentators will say that payday loans are the cause of financial difficulties and certainly for many politicians and journalists, the industry has become an easy proxy for some wider social issues. Um, we think that with the right safeguards guards in place, short-term loans can help people in, in financial difficulty. And one year on, there's lots of negativity in the media and parliament, and we're, we're seeing signs of slightly more balanced with some um, more informed commentators. But as with any regulation, uh, it has to be proportionate. Um, it's vital that future policy is shaped by reality and not rhetoric, um, that it's not a knee-jerk reaction to headlines, um, knee-jerk reactions have a bad track record, and we'll see how the Chancellor's plays out um, in due time. But you know, I think the time's come for, some, for a responsible part of the short-term lending sector to take its place at the table. Um, and we will work with politicians, we'll work with our new regulator, other credit providers in the debt sector, to help play our role in uh, shaping uh, the financial services sector of the future. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, if I could ask John Fairhurst to uh, speak. John is the uh, managing director of Pay Plan, a uh, very successful, fast growing debt management firm that has, has obviously uh, succeeded very well in the legacy environment. And uh, we're going to ask John to talk about uh, how his organization is having to adjust uh, to what will be the new environment. Thank you. Um, I think first a few words about the debt advice sector. Um, it's quite a diverse sector. Um, at one end of the spectrum, I guess you have the well-known charities, people like Citizens Advice Bureaus, who have been doing the job for, I think, about 80 years now. At the other end of the spectrum, we have what has been historically a growing number of fee-charging firms who charge, in some cases, relatively <coughs> high fees, and in some cases, offer quite a poor service. And we sit, I guess, in the middle. Payplan are a commercial provider, um, but we offer a free-to-consumer service. We operate what's termed the fair share model. So our service is funded by voluntary contributions from, from creditors. And as a free-to-consumer provider, we have been able to develop a niche in the marketplace. We're the only people in that niche, but the only commercial firm offering a free-to-consumer service. Um, we've, we've been broadly aligned with charitable providers in many areas. If you look on the Money Advice Service website, for example, we're on the list of the good guys. Um, but if you speak in other, in other forums, in other environments, we're perhaps seen as a, an evil commercial provider. So we sort of straddle the divide slightly. <laughs> um, but we've, we've grown steadily over the years. We've, we, we will help about 100,000 new customers this year. Help means quite a detailed assessment of their circumstances, quite a lot of work to help them understand their financial difficulties and offer them ways forward. Um, for many of those clients, we help them move into a repayment arrangement whereby we will negotiate with their creditors, deal with their creditors, allow them to pay what they can afford to us, and we will then disperse those, disperse those funds to creditors. And that means we move about a quarter of a billion pounds of client funds um, from our clients to creditors. And the FCA look at that and they think, that's quite a lot of money. So uh, I think you know, the, what started as, I guess, quite a, an altruistic type style of organization that was trying to help people in debt has grown to quite a big organization now with a lot of staff and with pretty much no regulation. Regulation to date has been extremely low key for us. The Office of Fair Trading granted us our original license uh, on the basis of a, a single side of A4 where we ticked a few boxes. I think it cost us 50 quid, something like that. And that's how we started 15 years ago. And we've grown in a way that, that hasn't really changed that enormously. The Office of Fair Trading did do a review in 2010 um, of the debt management sector. There were concerns about some of the less reputable fee charges. Uh, there was lots of evidence that people were being ripped off. And so they did a, a compliance review, quite a detailed review. Um, our review consisted of a visit from a local trading standards officer who didn't understand debt advice. We had a cup of tea and a chat, and he decided we were one of the good guys, and <coughs> we went. Um, <laughs> but nevertheless, 
this review did flag up a lot of problems within the sector. I think the, one, a quote from the FT findings were poor advice based on inadequate information in the sector was widespread. Many providers were setting up arrangements without actually asking a customer what they can afford. They were deciding what they could charge as a fee and what would be a, an, an attractive amount for the consumer. And a lot of these arrangements failed very quickly. And I guess partly because of that, partly because of a lot of lobbying from people like Payplan, that there is a lot of, lot of difficulty within the sector. The FCA have decided that the debt management sector is high risk. I don't think we're seen as quite as high risk as the payday lending market, but not far off. I, I see it as number two in the list of, of high, risk, high risk sectors. So we're expecting the FCA to look very closely at us as an organization. Um, IVAs, I mentioned here, there's individual voluntary arrangements are formal insolvency solution. We offer, in fact, we're the biggest UK provider of IVAs at the moment. We, we, we set up five or six hundred a month, and they are regulated through our regulated professional body, in our case, the Insolvency Practitioners Association. But again, the regulation of IVAs is much, much less intrusive than we, we anticipate the FCA will be. And just to add a little bit more colour to how pay plan have grown and how we are, um, we started as a family business with a good idea. Not my family and sadly not my good idea. <laughs> <laughs> I've, been, I've been there 14 years and in that time we have grown. I joined with 100 staff, we've now got 1,600 and we have become one of the largest providers in the sector. In terms of free to consumer debt management plans, we have about half the market. Um, between us and Step Change, who are similar size, we have about 40% of the overall market. So um, we're quite big now. Um, we're 20% of the market. And we've grown pretty much organically. We've had little external pressure. So we've had little pressure from regulators. It's a family business, all the shareholders. We all work in the business still. So no external investors telling us we should do this, should do that. Um, we resisted the urge to float at the time when some of our competitors were. So we, we've just rich, literally grown bit by bit by bit. And every year we get surprised that we've employed an extra 100 staff, an extra 200 staff. That's how we've got to where we are. Um, in quite a comfortable way. Then when we first looked at the FCA, we thought, well, then what does it mean? Well, our product's really good. You know, it's free to the consumer. Everyone likes it. Lots of people refer to us. Lots of people like us, government like us. Government sees us as one of the good guys. Do we just need to evidence what we do a bit more clearly? And then we started looking and speaking to the FCA. And of course, as some of the previous speakers have alluded to, that is not the case. This is far more than a tidying up exercise. It isn't just about giving good advice. We're reasonably comfortable we give good advice. Um, but when we start to look at things like, do we have a clear and well thought out business strategy? Is our model resilient? Is our culture strong, appropriate? Is the governance process we have in place robust and our staff rose clear? If you'd asked me a year ago, I'd have said, yes, of course we have all those things. When we start to look at this and start to get questions and start to look at the FCA requirements, we haven't. And I think the, the thing which has stood out for me in recent months has been the gap between what we have been comfortable with and what we will be required to do next year. And you know, demonstrating on this to an independent third party is, is in my view, a, a much more challenging thing, particularly when you start to speak to the FCA and start to speak to commentators who are close to the FCA and the FCA's objectives within the new regime. They do seem to be there to make examples of people. They do seem to be there. They do feel they need to be there to actually make examples of people in a way that, that sort of vindicates previous lax regulation. And I guess, you know, if we're not careful, we're, we're going to be the victims of that. So we have embarked upon a huge program of work to try and demonstrate that. And the other thing we, we have as an issue, I guess, is, is we're not quite sure the FCA understand the sector well enough. We're not quite sure that their proposed regime, their proposed ways in which they operate the regime suit the current market. Someone from the FCA did comment to me that we, we as an organization fit least well of any provider with the new regime. Um, the, we're not a charity, but we don't charge fees. And the way in which we fit in that is a bit inconvenient. As things stand currently, unless things change, which we hope they will, we as a free-to-consumer provider who make a profit will be required to refer to free-to-consumer providers who don't make a profit, which seems to be a bit of a mockery. And I think you know, they acknowledge that that's a bit odd. Um, they say we need capital requirements to protect client funds. 
we distribute client funds within five working days at the most. Um, they think we need to have 10 million pounds in reserves to protect against that. And um, we've not got 10 million pounds at the moment, so we have an issue there too. So some of the requirements are very much, I think, up for discussion. The, the consultation, the current consultation closes next Monday. And there is a lot of active dialogue between us and I think other providers within the sector about just, just how that sector should look um, next year. This is a, a crazy of our to-do list. Um, it, is, it is a huge amount of work. We have a huge number of staff involved in this. It's, you know, it's, as I said earlier, it's, it's, it's easy to, to think you're doing all of these things already, but when you start to look at the detail of this, and in particular, that, that bullet point clarifies senior management roles. Well, is everyone clear about their role? Yes, they think they are. When you explain the approved persons regime to them and the responsibilities that brings, people become slightly less clear about their role, <laughs> slightly more nervous. And I think just, just getting all of those bits into place is, is the real challenge. It's, it's not doing any one component, it's tying those components together um, that we have found to be the real, the real difficulty here. So what, how, how will this change as an organization? I think in common with a lot of providers within our sector, we have grown up almost from a kitchen table. In fact, in our, in our organization's case, literally from a kitchen table. But within the sector, which represents, you know, there, there are hundreds of providers within the sector, most of them have grown up from a bright idea, a few people, and have developed in a fairly ad hoc way. There is a lot of entrepreneurial spirit within the sector. There's a lot of innovation within the sector. I think what the FCA is going to do is, first of all, without any doubt, substantially increase costs. Part of, part, of, part of the new regime, I think, is quite appealing for us as an organization. We've grown up slowly, slowly. I think it is time we grew up and started to become a bigger organization, had more structure. But it's quite an expensive thing to do. And I, I, you know, looking at some of our smaller competitors, I think, well, this is a, a huge challenge for a small organization. It's bad enough for us with lots of staff and decent resource to fund this. But for a smaller organization, with 10, 20, 50 staff, I can see this as being a, a very challenging change. Um, it will reduce our flexibility. Our, our appetite for risk will be much reduced. Our entrepreneurial spirit will be fettered. Um, is that good, is that bad? I don't know. I mean, I think government policy, uh, the FCA view at the moment, Treasury view at the moment, is clear that this is a good way forward. Um, I think safety is seem to be perhaps more important than, than developed. I think it will stifle to a certain extent innovation within the sector. And certainly for us, I mean, our, you know, we, we've tried new things in the past by the throwing wood against the wall principle. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, we walk away from it. That's, that's not really going to be an option going forward. So I guess just to conclude my, my, my presentation, as I, as, I, as I hope to come across, you know, the amount of work and the extent of cultural change within our organization and within any organization subject to this regime, I think, is substantial. The natural reaction of a lot of people, and certainly a lot of people within our, our organization when we first started to look at this, was to become quite defensive and inward looking, to think, well, well, we'll shut the doors, we'll move in. I think the regime does bring real opportunity. I mean, there are the obvious opportunities of people exiting the market. What does that mean? It means there are acquisition opportunities. There's already a lot of chatter around at the moment between providers who are looking to exit the market. Um, I think that will lead to consolidation. And in consolidation, we're going to see stronger, larger players emerging. Um, we hope to be one of them. Um, it also, I think, gives stronger relationships with third parties. We rely very heavily on third parties introducing cases to us. Our fair share model is great in that um, we don't have to charge our consumers, but we earn less than half the amount of fee charge we'd earn on the case. And so we're reliant on not having a low acquisition model. And as creditors embark upon the new FCA regime and get a bit of a shock as they compare and contrast FCA, FSA, their, their risk appetite is, is, is diving down as well. And I think you know, to be classified by the FCA as a high risk provider and to be authorized and to be operating without problems is going to be attractive for them and I think essential for them if they're going to work closely with us. And I think you know, that is going to apply to a wider range of third parties. So the credibility of our organization I hope, will improve markedly within the new regime. And also that extends to fundraising. If we want to go, if we want to acquire businesses, 
having a regulated entity which is clearly extremely well structured and well managed is going to be an attractive thing for funders. So I guess that's that's our view of the world going forward. Thank you. I'll uh, finish up um, with a few thoughts on uh, where we believe the immediate and medium term priorities for boards and for senior managers uh, within uh, organisations that are falling under the FCA's uh, gentle administration um, should be focusing. I'll probably uh, hopefully echo one or two points as well and emphasise some things you've already heard. Um, uh, just, a, just a point on timings, uh, obviously there's a, there a time scale set out in the consultation paper and uh, there's a, a time scales around authorisation and application of the full conk handbook. Um, I'm often asked by, by people who are new to the FCA as to whether or not the, the time scales that are set out in those consultations will actually be complied with, are we actually going to be forced to to, to do the, the things in the time scale that, that, that suggested, particularly when we know the final rules may uh, may only uh, may only be available a few weeks before the the effective date. Um, the answer I usually give is uh, yes, you will uh, be expected to do that. The, um, uh, the, there's an awful lot of uh, regulation, financial services regulation that is European Union driven, and uh, when you're dealing with the European Union, the potential for delay and political machinations is is extreme and. Uh, there are um, regulatory developments that have taken years longer than expected to actually make the rule book. Um, but I don't expect this initiative, which is entirely in the hands of, of the FCA, uh, to face the same kind of delays. And I would expect them to, to stick to those timings relatively rigorously. There may be some transitional arrangements that can be, can be uh, consulted into the process um, that may allow some flexibility. But broadly, those timescales uh, will pan out. Um, I think my overarching feeling looking at consumer credit firms, um, and I take a lot of comfort actually from, from what John had to say in terms of, uh, in terms of the, the, um, the work his organisation is having to do to consider the broader strategic governance, roles, responsibilities, that, 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 that dynamic. Um, so my concern is that consumer credit, which I think is probably fair to say has been the traditional preserve of, of lawyers, um, and it's been a... Um, been a uh, you know the devil in the detail of, uh, of consumer credit agreements um, and whilst that, uh, that, that there's still a, an important dimension there the organizations who devote are devoting currently all of their resources to uh, gap analysis against conk are really only seeing a, a part of the picture um, I mean that's an important piece of work to do in fact I would on your way out you'll be able to pick up uh, our, our fairly weighty uh, Tome that does exactly exactly that. Hopefully, hopefully does some of the work uh, you might otherwise have had to do in terms of gap analysis between current current rules and guidance and and the um, the new Conk rule book. But um, understand that that is only a, a fraction of the overall regulatory regime. Um, I was reflecting as, as Gavin was saying, there's going to be a team of 300 supervising the sector. Um, the simple maths tells me that 95% of those 300 will not have a background in consumer credit. Um, they will have a background in either other supervisory activity within the, the FCA um, or uh, they may uh, drag a few people in off the street. Um, but essentially, essentially, you can be sure their, their strengths are more likely to be in, in other areas of regulatory supervision. So they'll understand and be looking to apply uh, the approved persons regime. They'll understand and be looking to apply the financial promotions regime, the the CAS client money regime, the uh, appointed representatives regime, and all the all the all the technical aspects of what good looks like under those regimes. Um, so, uh, my expectation of the supervisory approach in the in the in the first few years is that it'll actually be the non conquer related areas that get the most focus and potentially pose the most challenge. Um, <clears throat> the FCA is already uh, very clearly on a day-to-day -day basis almost, made its interest in the payday lenders clear in the debt management sector. Um, a point I would make there, though, is, is essentially it's, in, it's inheriting those priorities from the OFT from, uh, from, from government, their uh, existing, uh, I won't call them issues, but focus areas. Um, it shouldn't be in any way, shape or form considered the end of the story. Uh, and in fact, the whole supervisory approach of the FCA, particularly the FCA as opposed to the FSA, um, is to undertake things called market studies, understanding the 
the economics and commerciality of, uh, of particular products and, and the way they're sold. Mm -hmm. Thematic reviews, um, basically, uh, um, uh, well, I have rather unkindly described them as fishing trips on occasion, but, but <clears throat> basically the kind of research that will allow them to start to draw their own conclusions about whether there are um, other issues in the marketplace and other products and sectors of the market that they should be focusing on. So um, I fully expect that, uh, that there will be um, other areas that fall under their scrutiny and move to the top of their list as, as we roll forward over the next few years. Um, so what should boards be thinking about at this precise moment? Well, <clears throat> um, getting uh, authorised, I think, would be an immediate priority. Uh, clearly, there's a, uh, there's a kind of a, a grandfathering process almost for, for current authorisations, but um, we won't be too far away from having to make full blown authorizations and for those who haven't seen a full-blown authorization before they are weighty tomes that require the organization to express potentially things they've never expressed before uh, and john talked about the kitchen table and 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 the organization developing from there you know, many very successful organizations in this sector have never had to write down really a, a strategy particularly if they, they they haven't had to you know obtain external funding um they haven't had to analyze in any structured form uh, what their conduct risks are and, and what, their, what, their, what the risks they, uh, they might pose to, to their consumers. They haven't had to define with too much detail their corporate structure and roles and responsibilities. Um, in order to pass an, uh, uh, the authorization process, it's not enough that, that firms uh, have potentially been functioning very successfully for a long period of time. It will be necessary for them to be able to articulate these things um, in a very clear, in a very clear way, and that is going to uh, potentially be be a challenge. It won't be the one sheet of uh, paper; it'll be um, considerable, considerable exercise in some cases. Um, and one of the things that that often doing this starts to throw up is um, lack of clarity. And, and the regulator loves clarity, black and white, binary kind of world. Um, so the lack of clarity about exactly who is responsible for certain activities within the organization, for, for the key risks you have in, as an organization, who is responsible for managing those risks? Um, you have someone managing an area, how is that area oversighted? What's the next level of check upon them, uh, oversight committees, um, board supervision, but, but how does that linkage work? What are the conflicts of interest in the organization? Uh, between uh, between you and your customers, between um, different types of customers, between your fee model and the way your staff are, are paid and remunerated, what what bad behaviours or damaging behaviours could could that could that throw up in terms of conflicts? Um, I mean, these are all uh, areas. I'm glad to say that that regulated organisations have, have, have um, dealt with over the years. It's not mystical um, in the same way that the FCA knows what good looks like. You know, a lot, of, a lot of other people will know what good's like, good, good looks like um, and how to express these things. Um, so the answers are out there, but, but uh, I wouldn't underestimate as a sector um, the uh, degree of unfamiliarity that may, be, uh, that may be pertain in these cases. <clears throat> Some of the timescales, uh, which you're probably very familiar with. Um, are you fully compliant today with all the requirements of the current OFT regime? Uh, I mean, uh, are you um, ready for the, uh, the full conch regime? Um, I mean, the, the, these are things that need to be evidenced through gap analysis, essentially. Um, I was reflecting uh, the other day with, with one of the team that, um, that uh, you know, the, 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 don't underestimate the FCA's ability to, uh, to get into historic business practices that precede them taking responsibility. Um, you may say, well, that was before the FCA had authority here, so they can't be interested in, in what we were doing then. Um, through their interest in, 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 in DISP, which is the Disputes Handbook, the Complaints Handling Handbook, and the, the obligations under that for a firm to, to, treat, its, uh, to treat people with whom it is in dispute, its customers, uh, to treat them fairly, uh, they have a great lever for actually getting into, uh, getting into uh, past business practices. And they may not be able to uh, 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 catch you for the past business practice, but they can make sure that you, uh, you respond fairly and, uh, and make good today. Um, so um, gap analysis, there's a clear, clear level of effort required there. Um, the line at the bottom, what independent assurance do you have in respect of the above? 
Um, I mean, this is, uh, if any, it, this, this, may, this may be one of the most um, fundamental, slower going aspects of, of getting acquainted with FCA uh, regulation, the evidential requirements. It is not enough to be comfortable that you've done something to be able to talk about it. Um, you need to have, um, be able to evidence it. It's uh, um, the question, the most, uh, the, 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 one of the most uh, often phrased questions from, from the regulator during a supervisory visit is, how do you know that? What comfort do you get about that? What's the information that you receive on a regular basis that tells you that that is under control, is happening the way it should is? Um, and, and uh, you know, essentially, uh, the FCA tend to equate a lack of information uh, with, a, with a lack of effective control by the board of directors. It's, it's the, how can you fulfill your senior management responsibilities or your director's responsibilities unless you have the information trail that documents why you should be comfortable with a, with a given area. Um, so I would, I would emphasize to all of you, not, not only doing the gap analysis and, and working out what you need to do, but being able to go one step further and say, what evidence are we going to have? What reporting are we going to have internally? What processes internally that, we'll, that we can say is the source of our evidence for, for this happening? Um, and when people talk about a lot of the extra costs the industry is going to sustain, you know, for me, this is one of those key areas. It's, it's, uh, it's going, going into the evidential, the monitoring, the review uh, exercises that you'll need to have internally in order to demonstrate that you're in control. Um, on a more personal level, for board members, uh, obviously as a director you will be a, uh, being an approved person uh, f fulfilling a control function. Um, I'm very familiar with a few organisations where the board of directors uh, consists of um, spouses of some of the wives, uh, sorry, spouses of some of the directors um, who have no actual day-to-day um, -day role in the, the business. Um, I mean, clearly, for instance, that's something that will not be uh, continuing um, unless you can show the individual in question is playing an active role, is fulfilling their obligations to the organization and is suitably skilled and experienced. Um, and what is sufficient skill and experience depends very much on the organization itself. Um, for instance, an organization which has a, a, a high amount of technology uh, within, its, uh, within its operations would be expected to you know, have directors or some director um, with that as a background with specialist skills in, in that area because otherwise how can a board be expected to to oversight you know what, a, what is a, a complex set of technology risks if they don't have the necessary expertise having financial expertise uh, having potentially regulatory compliance expertise starts to starts to be a starts to be a um, potential requirement for rather more diverse skill sets amongst uh, amongst the directors um, and when, uh, when the, the FCA, uh, as Mark uh, referred to at the, at the start, talk about you know, there may not be X thousand people that could actually meet the threshold that we, that we will need them to, that's, um, uh, uh, that's a very substantial challenge, potentially. Um, so, um, one of the things that will potentially occur during um, the application process is that anyone you put forward as an approved person may be subject to interview by the FCA. They do like to do that quite a lot, actually. Um, although the sheer numbers of people involved here is going to make that a challenge, but but up to this point, they've um, they've they've done uh, many many interviews. Um, they've also, in many cases, suggested uh, applications for approved persons are withdrawn because just on a paper-based review, they're not going to pass muster. Um, but even if you do, uh, if you do pass muster on paper, get, getting the interview process is, is not insignificant. Even um, even organisations that have been regulated by the, uh, the FSA, FCA for many, many years, still go to quite a lot of time and trouble to prepare their any individual that's going to have a regulatory interview to make sure that they are um, suitably briefed to give the right answers to the um, to the right questions, as it were, um, because performance in that in that panel interview um, is decisive, essentially, and if uh, Gavin referred to getting a sense for the organization's culture. If you know, some, of the, some of the cultural behaviors you, you, you portray in those interviews, your uh, understanding and awareness of the consumer issues in the sector to, that you're operating in, for instance, if that's not, if that's not up, totally on message, then um, there's a very good chance uh, you won't uh, be approved or 
you will uh, have to come back in six months or a year, having shown that you've taken some remedial action, and then apply again. Um, so organizations uh, could find themselves in some quite practical difficulties if, if some, or, uh, some number of their existing board of directors don't actually make it through that process. That, I think, might pose some immediate um, management organizational uh, power challenges in terms of how the organization is run. Um, so, a, a summary. I think um, I think it's probably fair to, fair to drill this uh, to, 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 to summarise this uh, slide even further into um, into saying that the activity I would expect to see today is uh, the preliminary work that would allow you to um, produce a successful application for um, authorisation. So, all of that information around structure, strategy, risks, governance, um, conflicts of interest, etc., uh, and for those that have looked at that application process, there's also a lot of information about financials and a lot of a lot of other form filling as well. But, but, but the, the, all everything that goes into that that should be a focus area. Um, and I think in some cases, well, I know in some cases that really does um, uh, does you know it's not it's not uh, not always a case of just jotting down what we all know to be true. Actually, that exercise can reveal um, either a, you know genuine uh, lack of strategic direction within the firm or some quite fundamental differences uh, between the, the management team about what that direction should be. So it's not a necessarily a simple documentation exercise. Um, so that's one priority. And, and, the other, and the second priority, obviously, the detailed gap analysis uh, to conk and to, to the other aspects of the uh, very substantial rule book that will, will apply, whether that's client money or um, the CISC rules around, uh, around areas such as outsourcing and technology, for instance. Um, I think I'll probably draw a close to my remarks there. Uh, yeah, I've, I've spoken to the Council of Mortgage Lenders. Um, not surprisingly, the position they're taking is, you know, this is going to be an individual judgment for uh, for indiv individual companies that we represent, and we can't, uh, you know, there isn't a common view, and we're not um, getting involved in that policy discussion. And I've also written to um, Sajid Javid um, just recently to say, you know, are you comfortable with this? Is this fair representation of uh, consumers? And, you know, how, are, are there implications for, um, you know, home buyers in the, in the, potentially near future when we're trying to increase home ownership. So I think it is an issue and it's one of those things that, um, you know, we're, we're not now just demonizing uh, lenders in this market, but we're stigmatizing the borrowers um, who use it as well. And I think that that is, it's a very worrying development. I mean, you know, we're all, we're all big people. We can take a bit of, of knocking, especially when you're a new in industry, especially when you do all of your, your kind of growing up in the glare of public eye, every trip, slip and fall is going to get pointed out and exaggerated. And so, you know, we take the, take the slings and arrows as you drive through these improvements. Um, but I think when it comes to borrowers, I think that that is uh, an unfair treatment and it's based purely on what the media are saying or what politicians are saying who are following a completely different agenda to one that is about consumer empowerment. You probably want to ask the commission that on <laughs> when they woke up Monday morning and wondered whether it was worth going to work. Um, yeah, I think that, you know, clearly with the FCA rule book um, has come in since the market investigation began and, and now we have some um, uh, sort of price intervention um, since that um, market investigation began. That has sort of uh, taken away a lot of options available to the Competition Commission. Personally, I'm hoping that you know, for a while I won't be a lone voice and that we'll get a market uh, investigation report that will um, open up uh, the market and, and provide a lot more information about how short-term lending works and that I won't be the only one saying, 
you know, it isn't it isn't all bad and there are areas of improvement and actually this is how the market functions and there isn't vast profits in this and all of those types of things. I suspect it won't be quite as glowing as that because it's a competition commission report. Um, but, uh, you know, I will be writing to the competition commission asking them now what they, they think their objective um, needs to be other than providing information to the regulator about how the market operates. Good question. Okay, well, if I just talk a bit about, you know, we've got the consultation closing next week and we have a, a short time scale. I think one of the concerns we've had is the extent to which the SA understand our sector. I think there have been some gaps in that knowledge. A positive, I guess I've, I've, I've observed over the last six months particularly, is their willingness to engage. So I have fairly regular dialogue with the FCA. I have fairly regular dialogue with Treasury. Um, it is a bit of a journey. I think um, the backstop comfort I draw is that if something really odd comes out, there are waiver provisions in there. So if we feel we really don't fit, we can ask. I mean, I've met the waiver team; they're, they're a bit new to this too. I mean, got, don't, don't quite know how that works. I'd be interested in your views on this, being a bit closer to it. Uh, but yeah, it's a journey, and we don't know how it's going to end up yet. And time is getting very, very tight. Yeah, I think in the in the same vein that that we're uh, as an industry learning how the FCA work. The FCA is learning how the industry works as well, and that will take some time. Um, the, the concern here is maybe that they'll, they'll take um, the, uh, a, a very low risk approach to this uh, and then rein back from that. So we just have to be careful where that's concerned. But in, in regards to changes um, from the CP to, to the rules, it would be, uh, I suppose, in a way for us to help uh, make those changes or, or, or to, in fact, kind of um, educate uh, the regulator, convince them. Um, and um, those changes that will, that they'll probably likely to be changes, we won't really get to hear about them until next March. Do you want to address the, the waiver process that the understanding process? Well, well, yes, uh, there's a dedicated waivers team, so there are, and there are elements whereby you can apply for a waiver, and that, that waiver will then be considered. Um, it's, uh, what they were classed as being a pragmatic approach. Um, it, can, it can be a drawn-out process, um, but it is something that is available and something that you should look at. Um, it, it, does, it does work, um, but not... It's not, uh, again, it's not a tick box exercise. I think, uh, personally, what they're going to be doing is they're going to be focusing a lot of their resource on the authorizations piece. They're also going to be trying to educate themselves as well, which is what they're doing at the moment. But there, there, there will be, come April, there will be a requirement for reporting into the FCA, and they will be using that information to help educate themselves as well. So there is a grace period for six months whereby the new, you know, the new uh, rules um, won't be applied that doesn't mean that they're not going to do any supervision within that, that time period. They, they won't. They will, as a risk-based regulator, they will focus on the areas which they think are, are highest risk. And they will use for the first six months the, the current um, uh, the guidance and the uh, CCA um, Act to, uh, as, as a gauge. And then after that, and there's also principles as well. The principles kicking on the 1st of April as well. So I wouldn't just rely on the fact that we got until um, October 2014. Okay, well, uh, con consumer, uh, the, um, the competition part is, is something that um, the FCA aren't relatively comfortable with. It's not where they sit. Um, it is something that's really, in a way, has been imposed on them by the government. But what it is, it's, 
there are three objectives. The first one obviously being uh, consumer protection. It's front and center, and, uh, and the other two really are quite secondary. Um, and they're considerations if, you know, if everything's okay with the customer, then it's secondary consideration. So really, it's, it is, it's something as an afterthought that they use competition. Does that answer your no, question? Well, I can see, I can see that. <laughs> You'd probably echo it. Yeah. But in, ter in terms of the um, in terms of the, the, the cost benefit analysis that goes into these consultation papers, yep. Um, do you think? They're, they're... Well, I think they're probably underestimate. Uh, and they're they're just the tip of the iceberg, really, and and they probably skew it to the kind of the, the minimum. There's all these unforeseen costs. I mean, getting getting a compliance team together from scratch. <coughs> Is going to cost a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of you know senior senior management uh, thought processes. I mean, it, to say that it's going to cost two uh, two hundred million for startup, I think is is a, an underestimate. 